Well, hello there, listeners. It's Susie New here from the Australian Society of Anesthetists, and welcome to our podcast. It's called Australian Anesthesia, and it's where we talk about all things relevant to anesthesia in Australia. This episode is a little bit different from my usual ones in that I'm not interviewing anyone. I'm actually giving a summary of a presentation that I've been working on about gender inclusion and medical leadership. It's not just going to be on gender equity. It's not just for women, even though I'm hoping that this will come out for International Women's Day, which is on the 8th of March, by the way. This episode will also be talking about some of my thoughts on leadership. Although I'm talking about gender inclusion, I'm not really limiting this to just gender. There's a whole lot of ways that organisations such as the ASA could improve our diversity. And it's something that we need to be talking about and working on. The other thing is that this is based on my perspectives from the last few years being involved in the ASA at a senior level on the board, obviously as president and now still on the board and still very much involved with the committees of the ASA. In fact, when I look back at the history of the ASA, we've had a very strong commitment to gender equity and diversity, which has not been easy given that the ASA was formed in 1934. So of course, you know, gender inclusion has changed a lot over that time. If you want to learn more about how the ASA has approached gender diversity, gender inclusion, then I suggest you read Gwen Wilson's 50-year history of the ASA. She's done a great job there in discussing it. And I do mention it as well in my Jeffrey K. Oration, which is the talk that the presidents give at the end of their term as a bit of a reflection of their time in the role. So I can put a link to that. It's on our YouTube channel. I'll put a link to that in the episode notes for this podcast. Okay, so let's get into it. So the first thing I talk about is outlining gender inequality in the Australian workplace. This concept came to me when I attended an AMA, an Australian Medical Association Summit back in, I think it was 2019. And there was a presentation which mentioned this concept called the gender jaws, which I had never heard of before. If you can imagine, say, an open pair of scissors, then this is what the gender jaws kind of looks like. And that is that, in general, in Australia, there are more women graduating from university. So that's like the handle of the scissors. And then what we then find is that early in people's careers, the number of men start to outnumber the number of women. Where do the women go? I'll answer that question in a bit. So that's where, if you like, there's that crossover, that hinge in the pair of scissors. And then as people move through their career paths, the proportion of women declines so that there's very few women in senior leadership roles at executive, board and CEO level, whereas the proportion of men increases. So this has been widely studied and a really good place to go and look at some of this information if you want to delve a bit further is the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. And in fact, we did have at that AMA summit someone from the Workplace Gender Equality Agency speaking, which is where I learned this data. So do we still have this same pattern in anaesthesia? And in fact, we do. According to the latest Dean's report, about 53% of medical students who were graduating were women. So again, women outnumber men as medical student graduates. So looking at our own ASA database, we could see that of the trainees, about 45% of them are women. So again, there is this drop off between medical graduate and then entering anesthesia training. Across our membership, about one third of our members are women. And that's partly also generational. There were a lot fewer women specializing in medicine. And because we have hopefully nice long careers, we do tend to see that ongoing generational impact of having more men in our membership. I also present the composition of our ASA committees because I really think it's important that our committees represent the anaesthetists of Australia in terms of our composition. So across our committees, about 30% of our committee members are women. That's across all of them. There are some committees that are still very skewed and have a lot more men on them and also some that have a lot more women on them, which is very interesting. The latest official figures from the ASA is that a third of our board members are women. However, at our most recent board meeting earlier this year, we had 50-50 representation of men and women on the board, which is very exciting. At the moment, there are six board members, so three board members are women, three board members are men. I'm going to come back to that figure in a little bit. Now, you might think that's all well and good, but does gender equality in the workplace actually make a difference? Well, on a national level, countries that involve more women in the workplace tend to do better in terms of gross domestic products. So they do better on an economic level. 
On an organizational level, it's been found that having more women in senior positions can lead to better decision making, greater innovation, and overall better financial performance. There's also been studies at a societal level that show that greater participation of women in the workforce and therefore greater generation of assets and their own wealth helps to prevent violence against women. And that would be a great thing, wouldn't it? And the flow and effects of all of this is for the individual women themselves in that that reduces the pay gap between men and women. In the figures that I looked at when I was preparing this talk, women who were working full time had about 14% less average weekly earnings compared to men also working full-time. And this also translates across to medicine. This also then flows onto superannuation in that women tend to finish their careers with about 23% less superannuation than men. The pandemic has made these figures worse. And I did glimpse the latest report from the Workplace Gender Equality Agency that showed a much bigger difference between average weekly earnings between men and women. We do see that the differences in gender equality also make a difference in medicine. So for us as healthcare workers, in countries where people do not get paid professional development allowances, women are less likely to attend national conferences, which we, I hope, all agree are very handy to meet other people and also to help keep up to date. A lot of medical equipment is designed and prototyped on men rather than women. So a great example of this recently was access to fit-tested N95 and P2 respirators. Most of them have been designed for men. The men's sizes, typically the larger ones, were much more available during the pandemic than the smaller size ones. This became a problem in healthcare where there are more women than men in the workforce. Also, a lot of research grants, research positions, research funding tends to go to men or projects led by men. And this means that men have a bigger influence on the research agenda. I found a paper from 2016 that showed that 43, so less than half of clinical medicine studies actually report the difference between male and female populations. And I'll come back to the significance of that in a little moment. But when men drive the research agenda, it means that aspects of women's health won't necessarily be studied. And the great example of that is more recently, I don't know about you, but I heard a lot of anecdotal reports about changes in menstruation due to vaccination. And there was also reports of changes to breast size. We had a great opportunity in collecting this data. So hopefully we will take away the important lesson that researching the effects of medical interventions on menstruation and breast size shouldn't be an afterthought in future research. Now for patients, gender differences do make a difference. Patients, particularly those undergoing gynecological or endoscopic procedures, tend to prefer proceduralists of a particular gender. And coming back to that paper I, I mentioned before about reporting the differences between male and female populations, it means that we haven't necessarily characterized disease particularly well in women. So the classic example there is cardiac disease. Women tend to be diagnosed later than men, and it's a significant time difference, seven to 10 years later. And also women tend to have a higher fatality when it comes to myocardial infarction because the classic symptoms of chest pain, etc., etc., you know them, have been described in men rather than women. The other one that I like with my interest in trauma is that seatbelt and seatbelt design was modelled around the male body. I saw a study which reported that women having the same level of trauma, as in the same force applied to their body, had a higher fatality, potentially because of the smaller body size, but also because of seatbelt design not being made specifically for women. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of a background on gender equity. I don't consider myself a huge expert on this. There are lots of people who can talk very eloquently on this. And part of this, I think, is because it's actually been very easy when we've been discussing these things around the ASA board and council table to get some improvements and ideas up and going. I haven't really had to argue the case about gender equity or inequity very strongly within the ASA. Okay, so I mentioned the gender jaws at the start, and the thought is that that arises out of two systems that are coming together at the same time, and they are the system of having children and the impact of that on people's careers, and then the broader issue of gender inequity. So having children at the moment is pretty much the domain of women, falling pregnant, giving birth, breastfeeding. But it doesn't mean that the whole impact of that has to be borne about by women and their careers rather than men. 
The person who presented this was an organizational psychologist and had done a lot of work with Google and other various large corporations in America, said that one of the biggest actions that we can take to address this is to encourage men to take parental leave and really advocate for equality in parental leave between men and women. And they also said that we also need to encourage men in senior roles to take parental leave because it's been generally found in the corporate world that men who are more junior will only take about half as much leave as their managers. Men, we were looking at you to model this. And there are so many reasons why this is beneficial for women in the workplace. All right. So there's a little bit about gender inequity. There's one idea for how we can tackle it. I want to talk a bit now about leadership as well. So a lot of organizations are looking towards putting women into leadership roles, which I think it's great. I was certainly in a leadership role and I learned a lot and I really enjoyed the experience. But just having one woman is not enough and it might be seen as a bit tokenistic as well. Being the only of anything, be it your ethnicity, your gender, your profession, etc., can be a really tough role to fill. You can certainly put a lot of pressure on yourself. Other people can put a lot of pressure on you. There can be this overall pressure to perform and a fear of speaking up and being seen as the only representative. And I think we've got to be really careful about that. So recent research has shown that you need three women on a board or a committee in order to have impact. It's about the first one being the only one there. Then the second one being able to support them in giving their voice. And then a third one to actually feel like they all have a role to contribute their ideas. And that's what I was getting to earlier. Even though we have 30% women in the ASA as members, we could aim for 30% representation of women on the board. But it is wonderful at the moment that we have 50-50. And I think we now have greater ability for women to have an impact on the board. So how do we keep building up more women into senior leadership roles? Well, first of all, and this is the crux, I think, of this whole thing, and I'm going to say it again at the end of this podcast to emphasize this, but we need men to be involved. And together, men and women, we need to create opportunities for other women to come through. Women don't always have access to those opportunities that other men have, such as that banter in the change room or traditionally in the business world, the model of going out and playing golf together. Women don't always have access to those opportunities, which then helps them become noticed and also helps them get promoted. So let's look at prioritizing relationship building and nurturing these connections that we have with women so that we can help to amplify them. And I think that's our duty as leaders, whether we're male or female, to keep contributing positively to future generations. And so therefore, we're constantly looking for people to continue to sponsor and amplify. And it's not just women, but it's also people, I think, from any underrepresented group. We also need to be mindful, and I think there was a really good point made by, I think it was one of the orthopedic associations, that they had set a quota of 10% women representation on their committees. But across their membership, they had 5% women. So they were asking a lot of their women orthopedic surgeon colleagues in terms of stepping up and committing to these roles. So what are some of the things that the ASA has done? Back in 2016, I was a board member and I was attending the annual general meeting during which I was getting re-elected as executive councillor. The annual general meeting occurs at the National Scientific Congress, the NSC, which is our big scientific educational event. And thank goodness it was happening in my home city. I'd already been to a year's worth of board meetings, so I had some familiarity with the board. But this time was different because I brought my seven-week-old baby with me because I couldn't leave her at home. And it made me realize the incredible support that I needed in order to get there. Even though it was in my home city, I knew the board, I knew the National Scientific Congress, and I've been to many congresses before. And thankfully, I had a very understanding board. I had a very understanding and supportive family. And I also had some wonderful wing women, Michelle Horn, Vanita Naranong. And I love that they didn't even ask me, they just showed up. That's what I mean. Real support. Anyway, when I looked around at our committee composition, I thought, when do people have time to commit to extra volunteer committee work? It's usually when your career is well established or you might be looking at retirement or also there's the serial people who just love doing committee work and I love you guys for doing that. So with that, we eventually came up with a policy for parents of young children. So if you were a committee member and you were a parent of a young child, then we would pay for your childcare in order for you to attend a committee meeting. 
And if that meant that you had to travel into state to attend a meeting and your child needed to be with you, then we would pay for travel expenses for you and your partner. And that policy still holds. At the time that I wrote it, I didn't think it was great governance to write a policy from which I would directly benefit. So I excluded the board from that policy. It would only apply to the ASA committees. Now that I'm no longer able to benefit from that policy, I can say that it has been broadened. And in fact, that move didn't come from me or the board. It came from council, which I think is great when you see an idea grow and then other people take interest in it to improve it even further. Now, the idea, as I said, came to me back in 2016 when I was still relatively new to the board. And and now this is where I segue into leadership. This is what you could call a tactical idea. So one way of looking at things that are tactical is that they only apply to one part of the organization. In this case, this policy would only apply to committee members. And the other way you can approach something that is tactical is that it's looking at doing things in a particular way. And of course, if you go to any leadership workshops or do any courses on this, there's a whole bigger discussion on what is tactical, but I'm not going to go into that now. And the reason I mention this is because often when we come onto a committee, which is often maybe the way that you might get involved with the ASA or the hospital committee, you're often thinking about things in this tactical way. How do we do things? How do we get the processes right? However, at some point in my leadership journey anyway, maybe this might be for you too, is that We needed to think about this strategically. So one way to look at something that is strategic is to say that this is something that applies to the whole organization, whereas tactical is perhaps just one component of an organization. The other way to look at it more conceptually is this is about doing the right things rather than doing a particular thing the right way. This talk often comes out in leadership talks, which is from military strategist Sun Tzu, that says that strategy without tactics, so the overall picture without knowing how to do things the right way, is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy, so doing things the right way without that overall picture, is the noise before defeat. So just again, strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. So looking at recent initiatives from the ASA from a gender inclusion perspective, we had this tactic. Great, we're going to have parents of young children, very busy time in their lives, ask them to be involved in ASA committees. We've got this great policy that's going to help support them. But where did that sit? So we really needed to think about this, I think, from a strategic point of view. And in order to think about something from a strategic point of view, we need to understand our strengths and weaknesses. And so that's why the board established annual reporting of gender mix to the board. And we published that on our website. And those figures that I gave you before were from the most recent annual report. We usually look at it at the last board meeting of the year, which is usually held in December. So the initial reports focused on gender breakdown within the wider membership as well as those within our committees. So we've now expanded this to include first authors of the journal that we produce, Anesthesia and Intensive Care. And if you want to hear more about Anesthesia and Intensive Care, I've done a separate podcast with Dr. Michael Cooper on the prizes from that journal from 2020. So please go back and listen to that episode. It's number 48. That's 48 on the Anesthesia and Intensive Care Journal and the prizes. So as I was saying, we now look at gender for the first authors of the journal that we produce as well as speakers at the National Scientific Congress. So one of the benefits of having the gender breakdown reported to the board annually is it starts to create a culture where we can talk about this around the council table. It's a regular feature. It's going to be on the agenda every year at that meeting. And our members can go and look at it. And I'm very grateful to the members who have gone looking for it on the ASA website and written to us and asked us questions about it. We should be asked those questions and be held accountable. Another quote that's often mentioned in leadership workshops is from management guru Peter Drucker. And it is, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So what that says to me is that you can have the best strategy. So yes, we've got this strategy that we really want to look at gender diversity within the ASA and look at how we can improve inclusion, not just of people from different genders, but also various groups that are underrepresented. Great strategy. We've got lots of tactical ideas for how to get some of this strategy implemented. But without the right culture, it's potentially going to flop. And we get the right culture by getting passionate people involved. So that's what culture eats strategy for breakfast says to me. 
And just to throw one more line at you, there's another thought within organizational psychology that structure eats culture for lunch. So we've got culture eating strategy for breakfast, but then we've got structure eating culture for lunch. This to me highlights that you need the structure and the capability within an organization in order to deliver the strategy. So what does this mean? It meant that at the start of my presidency, I convened many working groups and one of them was I convened a working group on gender equity. And we had a preliminary meeting and I found that there was lots of interest, lots of passionate people. Great that we could foster this culture that would help us deliver this strategy. So that gender equity working group has more recently been formalized. It's now called the Diversity Equity Subcommittee. It's chaired by an anesthetist from Adelaide by the name of Bridget Brown. And it's there to support the ASA in our goal of eliminating discrimination, which adversely affects our members. That is one of our policy documents that we would like to work to eliminate discrimination that adversely affects our members, anaesthetists, anaesthesia providers, anaesthesia trainees of Australia. Some of you may have heard me talk before about the Common Interest Group. This is a group of anaesthesia societies. It's us, the American Society of Anaesthesia, the Association of Great Britain and Ireland, the Canadian Society, South African Society, New Zealand Society. We meet regularly. And they've all been working very hard with gender equity and diversity as well. This subcommittee will also be working with the Common Interest Group so that we can have some shared work, some shared benchmarking, some shared resources across all six of our anaesthesia societies. So that is very exciting. One of the more recent pieces of work, and this is very, very exciting news, is that most recently we've been working with the Society for Pediatric Anesthesia in the U.S., And we've been given the go-ahead to start an Australian chapter of WELI, W-E-L-I, which stands for the Women's Empowerment and Leadership Initiative. It's a fantastic program. It's been up and running for a couple of years now. I'll put a link to their program in the episode notes. But it was basically, as I mentioned, it's been developed by the Society of Pediatric Anesthesia in the U.S., The ASA board was unanimous in supporting the development of an Australian chapter and the Welly organisers have been very, very generous in sharing all of their materials with us. So what's it do? Its goal is to assist women in anaesthesia with the skills, confidence and opportunities to achieve their career goals, whatever that might be, whether it's an academic position, a leadership position, whatever it might be. Some of the ways it delivers that is by giving expert coaching, And I have been amassing quite a number of amazing executive coaches out there. And I'm super excited that hopefully we're going to be introducing some of these guys to the ASA membership over the next year or longer. Anyway, but keep watching that space. But the other thing is that, as I said earlier, we need men and women working together as advocates. This is not just a women's issue. Life gets better for everyone when we improve gender inequality. The way the Welly program works is by setting up dyads or groups even of protégés and advisors who work together. Now, it's not just providing mentoring. And sure, yes, it's there and available. And as I mentioned, we're hopefully going to be delivering some amazing expert coaches in the coming years. But we need to realize that fixing gender inequality is not about fixing women. Women can be over-mentored, over-coached, but they're just not given the same opportunities and therefore don't advance their careers or are under-promoted. So that is a snapshot about Welly, Women's Empowerment Leadership Initiative. We're in the process of starting it up. It's still very, very, very new, but it does have approval from the board. It will be overseen by the Diversity Equity Subcommittee. So that's Bridget Brown's committee. I first learned about it when I attended a Spanza conference. So if I can find a link to that talk, I'll put it in the show notes. Of course, we're also keen to work with the other anaesthesia organisations in Australia and New Zealand. We're still having those conversations, so still a little bit early for me to say anything there. But hopefully there'll be some more news about this coming out soon if you are interested. And as I mentioned before, this is not just about women. If you're a man who wants to also be a champion of change, then please do get in contact with us. We're still in the very preliminary phases of forming up all the committees, but very, very indebted to the Society of Pediatric Anesthesia in the US for their generous sharing of resources. 
So thank you for listening, particularly the men out there. Thank you for coming to this podcast with an open mind. And hopefully you've realized this is not just about women. There's a a lot that can potentially be gained if we improve gender inequities in anesthesia. And apart from that, happy International Women's Day. I hope you're staying safe out there. And please do get in contact with us if you'd like to be involved at all. This episode of the Australian Anesthesia Podcast was produced by the Australian Society of Anesthetists, otherwise known as the ASA. More episodes can be found on the ASA website, asa at asa.org.au. Don't forget to follow or subscribe to receive the latest episodes, and of course, you're welcome to share them as widely as you wish. Please send any feedback to the ASA by emailing asa at asa.org.au. Music was by Mark Suss, and we hope you enjoyed listening.